Hello and welcome to the What is Justice Roundtable discussion. If you're joining us in the live audience, please be sure to close other tabs or other applications so you have the best audiovisual experience. Each month, Global Justice presents the What is Justice Roundtable discussion to bring together a range of leaders from across sectors and across generations to discuss the important issue of biblical justice. I'm Sosma Samuel Burnett, the president of Global Justice, and I'm pleased to serve as your moderator. I'm also pleased to present our panelists for this month. First, I'd like to introduce John Andrews. Jan John Andrews was the founding director of the Centennial Institute and a former Colorado legislator. Hello, John. Hello, Sosima. Listeners, glad to be with you all today. Thank you, John. We also have with us Larry Gaddis. Larry was the presiding judge for Placer County Superior Court, now retired and continues to serve on the bench. Welcome, Larry. Good morning, good afternoon. Good to be here. Great. And we also have with us Myron Steves. Myron is the dean and faculty member at Trinity Law School and also serves in private practice. Welcome, Myron. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, gentlemen, let's go ahead and get started with this conversation. So our, my first question, I'll just lob that one to you, John, um, is this concept of biblical justice. What does it mean to you, and how does it reflect both personally and professionally for you? One of my great spiritual heroes is C.S. Lewis, Sosma, and it occurs to me that as he is trying to establish the universality of the human instinct or objective standards of right and wrong, he starts with the simple concept of fairness, which is just our Anglo-Saxon rough equivalent to the Latin-derived term justice. And as Lewis points out, everybody has a sense of what's fair, even those who claim that there are no fixed ethical or moral standards of, of right and wrong or ill treatment of, of each other. They claim that it's all subjective, and yet Immediately you take away what somebody believes is theirs, or you fail to give them what they think they have coming, suddenly the cry of unfair arises. For me, biblical justice starts with the sovereignty of God. I have to contrast it, really to define it, with uh, its counterfeits. Biblical justice, as I understand it, is objective, not subjective. It is principled not situational, hence it is unvarying. It has to do with people's actions, not simply their status. And it has to do with individuals, not with groups. I can go ahead and apply that across all the fields that I've been able to work in in a long career, half a century and counting, which really spans education, politics, media, and ministry. But suffice to say, the keynote is from C.S. Lewis for me. Mm -hmm. Everybody has an instinct, wait a minute, that's not fair. I deserve fairness whether or not they acknowledge a fixed standard of justice. Great. Thank you so much, John. And Myron, similar question. Um, so, you know, what does this concept of biblical justice mean to you personally and professionally? Well, uh, historically, uh, through um, theological discussion of justice, it's been come to uh, be described as rendering to others what is due to them. Mm. And uh, scripture is consistent with that, with a lot of interesting applications. Um, it's interesting to me that the word judgment, used very frequently in scripture, doesn't always have the connotation we think of it as, as uh, um, harsh punishment coming down. Uh, judgment is used in a very positive sense many times, that uh, those who have been oppressed look forward to judgment in the sense that uh, it's going to equalize or bring equipoise to uh, a difficult situation, that God's judgment is a good, positive thing and is to be desired. Uh, I think simultaneously, the Bible speaks of uh, justice being needed provided for the poor, the downtrodden, the disenfranchised, but at the same time says that true justice is even-handed and doesn't favor the poor, that they are not to be rendered judgment uh, favorably just because they are poor. So this concept of, uh, of rendering what is due is um, consistent with every reference to judgment in the Bible. 
Hmm. That's a really interesting couple of points you make. You know, oftentimes, as you mentioned, judgment is viewed as sort of a negative, and, and yet, biblically speaking, it can be this positive, as you mentioned, and then this fairness applies equally, regardless of status or situation. Um, very interesting concepts. Uh, Larry, do you agree with these statements, or how would you describe your idea of biblical justice? Well, when, when we, I began uh, doing a little research into this, I realized that, you know, for years and years through uh, church Bible groups, uh, I'd been talking and listening to people talk about biblical justice, but I had never really thought, is there a definition of biblical justice that everyone can agree on? So mm -hmm. I, I began researching that. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, there's, there's many references to it here and there. And I also wanted to give some credit to, um, I just picked the minds of, uh, of eight people who I've been in a Bible group with for about 15 years, and we discussed it. We sat around one evening and discussed this, and I, I came up with some, uh, some kind of interesting concepts. Uh, whether these are absolutely true, whether people will uh, agree with them, I don't know. But, um, I mean, I started off with, the, uh, the idea first that biblical justice, what it is not. It, it's not just, it's not earthly justice, it's not social justice, it's not legal justice, it's, it's, it's quite different than that. And um, I really feel that biblical justice can be demonstrated and, and kind of seen only if we follow the uh, commandment of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I feel like that if we are actually if we are actually acting that way towards other people, we're doing unto them as they would have them do unto you, and, and we're going by the biblical principles that, that we believe. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're doing our best to provide biblical justice. Mm -hmm. Now, is that complete biblical justice? Well, absolutely not. Um, I think that that true biblical justice can only probably be achieved internally, mm -hmm. because externally. We're sinners. We, we do stupid things. God knows we do stupid things. And, and fortunately, uh, he allows us to do these things and, and, then, and, and learn from them and repent. And you know, we're, we're still going to get to heaven if we do the right things. Hmm. But, um, but biblical justice itself, it, it's, to me, it's justice that is, is uh, again, talked about, imposed by God, mm -hmm. not by man. I think it's something that we're striving to understand, right. even, you know, long-time practicing Christians, right. uh, with the understanding that um, we're probably never going to uh, get there while we are here on earth, but well, do our I best think, to. I think you write an interesting point that biblical justice is not just a definition, but it's a process and a development and something we learn and something we grow in, right, as we get to know the principles and, more importantly, who created the principles, you know, as we get to know Christ, as we get to know God. Um, Myron, let me switch gears for you a little bit and ask you, you know, given these definitions and perspectives that you've shared and also your own, um, how do you distinguish this concept that maybe isn't so easily definable, but how do you distinguish it from other forms of justice that we hear about all the time, criminal justice, social justice, etc.? Well, I, I think social justice is an inter interesting term. Um, I think to begin with, uh, the basic idea of justice, that we render to others what is due to them, um, we know intuitively through natural law we know that these are, are principles that we should follow that as we would want to be treated fairly we should treat others fairly and I think most cultures and most societies get this over the long haul through time we're blinded to it the closer it comes to our situation it's a little bit more difficult for us to adjudicate uh, justice in a situation where we have something at stake and I think also a culture can get blinded for a time of what really is justice. Mm -hmm. And I think social justice, as commonly used today, means something other than biblical justice that we're talking about. That adjective is put in front of there because people don't like the word justice, and they need the modifier to turn it into something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's difficult to define exactly what social justice, which is a term thrown around a lot these days, means. But I think to a great extent it means, uh, by those who use that term, 
uh, modified justice or justice plus. We don't really want a fair result. We want to tip the scales somewhat in favor of uh, a particular interest group. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the most part, when we use that term, that interest group is um, those that historically have had difficulty with access to justice or being treated fairly. So uh, there's kind of a, a noble underlying desire mm -hmm. by those who use this term but I think in practical application, it never works because mm -hmm. anything that deviates from uh, a true plumb line of justice is a deviation, not an enhancement of justice. Interesting. Now, John Andrews, you know, I think Myron presents an interesting concept of social justice and also that's how we might distinguish it with biblical justice. But how do you distinguish it? You know, do you agree with Myron Stephen or is it something a little bit different for you? I like the way Myron focused on the thought of an interest group and deeper yet, a group. To me, justice only is applicable from one individual to another and ultimately from the person of God to each of us human beings as individual persons. It's a contradiction in terms to speak of collective justice, even as it would be to speak of cold fire or dry water. It's an oxymoron. Justice, by definition, as I understand it and as I, as I find it in the Torah and throughout the Law and the Prophets of the Old Testament, uh, all the poetic works of the Old Testament and certainly fulfilled in the Gospel and the New Testament, justice has to be about individuals. We've said rendering to the individual what is due to him or her, and I take it a step further and think of what is deserved by that individual going back, as I said earlier, to how they have acted, how have they conducted themselves. And Larry, I thought, made an interesting point in the previous segment, and that is human beings will never experience nor render to each other perfect justice. We seek to approximate it. God alone renders justice, and it is rendered in the span of eternity, not always in this earthly life. Mm -hmm. Jesus makes this clear in his parable of Dives and Lazarus, for example. And justice also is uh, inseparable in God's economy from mercy. We as human beings have a very difficult time understanding, let alone acting out, how justice and mercy can be indivisibly provided. But that's really what God does in the incarnation the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. He alone has done it and can do it. Great. Well, let me get to you, Larry. So same question, and given what both John and Myron have talked about, how do you distinguish this idea of biblical justice from other forms of justice that we so commonly hear? Well, I think one of John's comments was right on as far as, I guess, quote, social justice. That can only That only happens between one person and another person, or maybe one group and another group. But when you talk about something like social justice, um, what social are we talking about? What society are we talking about? You know, societies change, and therefore uh, they think their concept of justice is fine, and ours may be completely different. Um, whereas I see, you know, biblical justice is again very constant. Um, the Bible, God has given us, you know, some of these rules to help us get there, but uh, it. it God is going to be the one that lays that out. Now, social justice, and then I guess moving on to, to legal justice is where I've spent you know most of my life and my career. Legal justice, it, as I like to believe that uh, that legal justice trickled out of the Bible, out of the Ten Commandments, and, and and out of the laws that you know that that God gave us, you know, pretty black and white, and and they kind of trickled down. Of course, if you look at any um, any penal code, any code, uh, all of a sudden it has 10,000 pages. You wonder how it got that far. I, I certainly do in many times. Um, but, you know, I hope that that, that is the, the basis for it. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, social justice and legal justice is always a moving target, even in uh, one set society. Mm -hmm. Ten years later, things have completely changed. Gun laws, uh, laws of... Uh, Family law, it, it, things just just change so much. But uh, my feeling is 
that hopefully our society uh, is continues to be guided by Christian principles because I believe that those Christian principles is, is it, it, God moving us down this, this trough towards where we're supposed to go. We'll mm -hmm. never get there in this life, but at least we're trying to get there. Well, uh, I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, those are just some of the things that, that occurred to me when, exactly. when we talked about the two different That makes things. sense. You know, let me challenge you all, uh, you know, with the fact that we've just said, okay, uh, biblical justice is very difficult to find, and we also said that biblical justice is maybe not achievable, you know, in this uh, age or in this life, and then also the fact that biblical justice is more uh, personal, individual than collective. So let me ask you the tough question. So why pursue biblical justice? John, do you want to start that one off? Even though we cannot achieve perfection, God expects of us to do the best that we can with the situations handed to us and the endowments that, that uh, the world has given us. Yes. We have to, as, as Jesus says in one of his uh, parables, all servants by God's standards are relatively unprofitable servants, but it does not excuse any of us, you, me, or, or any certainly any Christian, and ultimately under God's authority in this world, whether people know him or not. It's made clear in the first chapter of Romans, natural law was referenced by Larry or Myron already. Mm -hmm. No one is without a, that, that basic understanding of right and wrong, which C.S. Lewis epitomizes as everybody says, I know what's fair. Be fair to me. Stop being unfair to me. And so we, we have the obligation to do the best we can, albeit that God regards us as unprofitable servants. And this is ultimately where the mercy of the cross and the resurrection and the atonement that Jesus has made for us as sinners comes into play. That's where God's justice and mercy are inseparably experienced. Great. Larry, how would you answer that question? Why pursue justice? Well, I think that the pursuit of justice is something that is incumbent on every Christian. Uh, Again, we learn, uh, we learn the rules, we learn things that we should do, we realize that we should do unto others as you would have them do unto us, and, and then I think ultimately we have to realize that we're going to be judged. Mm -hmm. and, and some of the, uh, the things we're going to be judged on is how, how hard we have, have strived to, to achieve biblical justice or even to understand biblical justice. Great. Um, so, I just, I, I just think that as a Christian, it's something that, that God asks me to do and tells me that, now there's a reward for doing this, too. And the reason you do this is that you are going to be judged. Right. And, and that's why I, I think it's, it's important to, to look for it. We could obviously just ignore it and, and go on our merry way and think, well, I'm being a good person and, and that sort of thing. But again, I don't think that's what uh, what God asks us to do. I think He wants us to do our best to understand it as best we can, sure. and uh, yeah, Certainly. move in right. that direction. My also, my, oh, go ahead. My, there's also an experiential test that has been met by four thousand years of recorded history, sacred and salvation history, where manifestly, uh, by any objective yardstick. God's law as made known to us through the Ten Commandments, as one of my colleagues referenced a moment ago, is the most workable framework for human flourishing. Mm -hmm. Imperfectly applied as it may be through our imperfections and our fallenness, nothing else works as well and history proves it. Right, great. Myron, let me get you the last word on this question. Why pursue justice? Well, I well, we seek perfection in any of the virtues. Um, knowledge that we can't attain it isn't a reason to abandon it. Mm. Uh, interestingly, justice is one of the four cardinal virtues, along with uh, prudence, courage, um, and uh, temperance. And uh, we should grow in all these areas. And uh, generally, in our pursuit of justice, where we fall short is not that uh, we are never capable of making just decisions, it's that in the midst of many just decisions we also make some bad ones. Mm -hmm. And I think in comparison with that is courage, that uh, 
we lack the capacity because of our sinful nature to always be courageous. That doesn't mean that we don't at times experience moments when uh, we show uncharacteristically great courage mm -hmm. uh, because God has blessed us with the ability to do something like that in a situation. And uh, the same thing holds true with justice is it is hard to attain because our sinful natures makes us blinded to the significance of our own experience, um, a way that we may emphasize, empathize, empathize with uh, those who are suffering from a lack of justice. And uh, the fact that we fall flat so many times is no reason not to have that as our aim and head towards it with all the energy God gives us. Absolutely. And, you know, and I might add to that just this idea that when we pursue justice, we may also be pursuing these other virtues. We might also be demonstrating courage. And so there's a lot of goods that come out of the pursuit of, uh, if you'd agree with that. Uh, one more question for everyone. Can I add something, just oh, one sorry. thing to that? And I, I want to give credit to this to a, a young lady who, who just uh, graduated law school and became a district attorney um, talking about achieving justice, uh, not particularly biblical justice, but this is a, a comment that she made, I thought, pretty prophetic. It says that she realizes, after working for two months as a district attorney, that, that she's not achieving justice by convicting people or sending them to prison or, or punishing them. But what she's doing is helping to reinforce that sin has consequences mm -hmm. in a culture where anything goes. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a, um, I thought that was a, a pretty right-on thing. Because oh, you know, most people that, that get convicted uh, probably don't think of it as a sin. But um, in my years on the bench, uh, I slip that in every now and then. <laughs> Let's blow that young woman. <laughs> thank you, Larry, and thank you, John. Yeah, Myron, I'll let you start this next question, and that is this idea of biblical justice. We've talked about the concept, but let's talk about the application. Is there a particular issue that is of concern to you where biblical justice really really applies or should apply? Well, I, I think one of the dilemmas that I um, struggle with in our modern legal system is that the administration of justice in our court system is expensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are undeniably situations that I've seen in court where um, those who could afford to present their case well um, had a tremendous advantage. I don't think it's as bad as the media portrays it, but uh, I have seen situations where people have abandoned good cases because they just ran out of money. Right. Um, or had a great case on appeal and they didn't pursue it because the costs were high. And I struggle with what that means for us as Christians in a world where we've got a nation with a justice system that I think is fantastic. It's the best in the world in many ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, how we address the needs of those who don't have access to it is something um, I struggle with without actually having much to offer in the way of an answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely an injustice that we may need to focus on and figure out uh, over time, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I can say, you know, from practical experience that over the past 20 years, that concern it has really been at the forefront of uh, judicial councils, at least in California. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, But like you said, it all boils down to money. If we had the money, uh, we would start, you know, uh, clinics and places where people, Ask the questions that they don't understand to help them through the system. I know there's more of that, but mm -hmm. I, I agree with Myron. That's that's a great concern. Mm -hmm. Well, John, let me come up to you. So if there's a major injustice that you're particularly concerned about, uh, where biblical justice applies, biblical principles apply, what would that be? Well, we've been through the presidential cam, uh, conventions of both major parties in the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. and everyone is or ought to be concerned with and indeed touched to the heart by poverty and hunger prevailing too often in this most affluent of countries, America, but certainly prevailing still in large parts of the world. Some say social justice compelled redistribution of wealth is the only answer. I think biblical justice having to do with such precepts from the Torah imported into the New Testament as 
don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn. That means you, you will get what you have earned. And the inverse of it, he who doesn't work, neither shall he eat, writes Paul rather sternly to Timothy at one point. If you haven't earned it, you don't receive it. Then when we, when we wrap in generosity and charity, which is commanded throughout every page of scripture by individuals, not by compelled redistribution, and when we look at, as I said a moment ago, the track record of history, which system works the best, a property rights, earning-based wealth creation by individual effort, tempered with charity, not by government compulsion, Mm -hmm. is going to feed the most people, alleviate the most poverty. Even a Confucian, not Christian system like China, as that market economic property rights based principle has been turned loose in the last 20 or 30 years has moved more people out of poverty than ever seen before in human history. Bring it home to the United States of America, an oft criticized capitalist corporation started by one enterprising man in Arkansas, Walmart, is called the greatest poverty reliever that America has ever seen. You know, it's interesting what you shared because in some senses, the world is sort of moving away from the model of poverty alleviation that we're moving to, if that makes sense. You know, we tend to be focused a lot on um, social services, social provision, where other areas are starting to realize the impact of the church impact of other structures of, you know, of growth in the economy. So that might be something for us to take note of. Larry, anything else you want to add on this topic? Otherwise, we'll close this set of questions and, and wrap up our, our session. Well, just briefly, I think that John's topic is, is just incredibly um, on point for nowadays. Like you said, also, I believe that yeah, our country is moving one direction where the rest of the, country, the world is kind of moving the other direction because of their experience. But I guess one topic close, near and dear to me, is uh, the the horrible relationship now, police with public and in various races, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, having dealt with police officers and you know the public for years as a judge, uh, I'm no good police, bad police, good people, bad people, and it just it, to me is just so sad that it's become such a it's like two warring camps now. And it, one side gets labeled with this, and the other guy gets labeled with that. And I just go back to the, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and realize that, that you know, the police are doing a job, and, but, but people are afraid of the police for good reasons. And uh, there just needs to be some, a, more, a lot more tolerance, a lot more understanding there um, in, in that situation. I certainly don't think that... Uh, a lot of the things that have happened in California, the the, the lessening of the, the criminal penalties, the this and that, they're, they're, that's kind of a mess. I don't think that's particularly helping. Yeah. But there are things that can be done short of that that should be done, and they, they just have to be done if you know if our social structures are going to stay going to stay where it should be. Right. And uh, biblical justice can play a great part in that. Great. Thank you so much. Now, gentlemen, we only have a brief minute or so left, and I'd like to take a moment to just allow each of you to share a little bit about the projects that you're currently working on. John Andrews, uh, tell us a little bit about your current work and projects. Well, after seven years as Vice President of Public Policy at Colorado Christian University here in Lakewood, Colorado, I'm into new ventures, which includes a couple of books applying my understanding of biblical truth to politics and economics, as I've tried to suggest in this discussion with all of you today. One book's called Responsibility Reborn. The other one is called Backbone, Colorado, USA. Both are available on Amazon. People that would like to know more about the way I apply my Christian beliefs and freedom priorities to the issues, check those books. Great. And can we find them on Amazon? Absolutely. Okay, check them out, John Andrews. Uh, Myron Steves. Uh, well, I've just finished uh, six years as the Dean of Trinity Law School and am transitioning back to full-time law practice again. Uh, my practice is primarily advising nonprofit organizations on their legal issues. Uh, it's an area that I started in uh, 25 years ago. And at that time, it was relatively easy for lay people to operate a nonprofit organization. In the last quarter century, it has become so heavily regulated uh, that it's a difficult area to work in. So 
I, I have my work cut out, and most of my clients are churches, denominations, and ministries. And uh, it's an exciting thing that I enjoy doing, and I'm happy to be able to do it full time again. And I'm sure the demand for your services will be high, given our current context. Uh, Larry Gaddis, you've been serving on the bench for many years, now retired, but working on many projects. So tell us a little bit about what you're up to or what priorities you'd like to share. Well, first and foremost, I'm retired, which I recommend to anyone. <laughs> uh, secondly, however, uh, I still uh, am a, uh, a visiting judge when I'm in California. I work uh, pretty much full time for whatever they need, um, which makes a lot of sense. It, it took me 24 years to figure it out, so I think I've got a, a flavor for it. Uh, I'm on various, you know, various boards and that sort of thing. But you know, probably most interestingly and importantly, uh, I'd begun with my wife doing things such as serving as food banks and shelters and things like that. We have a lot of poverty up here, and to me, it's just interesting that one of my favorite pastors said it was very important to be a servant leader, and. Uh, so uh, we're, we're doing garage sales to raise money. We're helping with the food. We're doing that sort of thing. We're building a new shelter. So, you know, there's so many things to do out there in, in life that you would you never know unless you wander out there and do them. So um, that's what I'm looking at doing. And then uh, later on when I grow up, I'll probably try to do something different. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you all panelists for participating in this conversation today, for pursuing justice, and for being the servant leaders that you are. Thank you, John Andrews, thank you, Myron Steves, and thank you, Larry Gaddis, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Please join us again next month for our What is Justice Roundtable discussion. Mm -hmm.